So the scene is Easter 2011. My favourite TV show in the world has come back, and the Doctor and all of his friends are hanging out on the beach. When this happens. In that one second, my 15 year old brain flipped. Story arcs are one thing. Last year we had the Pandorica and the cracks in Amy's wall. Now, I feel like this was a very safe arc from the Rusty Davies school of adhering to the repeated meme. Ha, <laughs> get it? But then in series six, I think Moffat gets a bit too big for his boots. I don't blame him, I probably would have made something similar. But then I would have had the common decency not to resolve it with the Doctor robot. The most telegraphed twist in history. Moffat has delivered some brilliant twists through the years, but when it matters, at the end of a long arc, he always drops the ball. And I'm a Moffat stan, my favourite showrunner. Very rarely delivered satisfaction or a resolution told in the right order. Everything from the Big Bang onwards starts telling this grand, very vague narrative that just expects you to go with it and maybe get some answers further down the line, which was incredibly frustrating at the time of viewing because some of these arcs went on for four years. My favourite story in the world is Time of the Doctor, not simply just because it's a beautifully acted, beautifully shot drama but also because it's Moffat finally paying his rent. His overdue delivery on some of these resolutions and story arcs and who are the silence anyway? Which parts does River factor into? What separates the silence from the monks to the silence? Why did the TARDIS explode? I know now, but it would have been great to be able to discern at the time. There were so many mysteries that they got tangled up in each other. Every season finale was like a grab bag of answers, resolutions that did not help me. Which is why Time of the Doctor was like therapy. And this is all rather indicative of how Doctor Who begun to handle the story arc, especially in Matt Smith's run. The mess of story arcs that seemed to raise more questions than they answered actually made me consider not being a Doctor Who fan back in 2012, 13? That fact, combined with a very mediocre run, actually pushed me away from the show for a good period of time. So when I saw the Doctor get shot dead on a beach by an astronaut in 2011, that was a glimpse, a brief moment of interest. That slowly abused and confused that trust for the next 12 episodes. It bled me dry. Series 6 was all bark and no bite. And it's proof that a bad story arc can push people away from the show differently to just normal bad episodes. The storytelling reminded me of a comic book event. Some big bombastic event happens, but it's only as a catalyst to set up other events. Other stories. I wish I could go back to 2011 and tell Sam that the Doctor's death, the crack in the wall, silence will fall, and Amy's pregnancy aren't actually that linked at all. Here I am, a passive viewer drawing diagrams like a crazy man, and the series just never even delivered. The wedding of River Song still makes me want to tear my hair out. And a good man goes to war and name of the Doctor aren't much better either. Reverse storytelling can be great, but I don't even know what order Moffat was telling this in. Anyway, welcome back. Here's four more of the worst Doctor Who story arcs. The Forge. I might catch some flack for this. These three stories are incredibly popular and very well renowned. The story begins with the Sixth Doctor and Evelyn, in a really grim little tale involving human vampires. Whilst Project Lazarus sees the Sixth Doctor get cloned, and the Seventh Doctor return to stop him. And it's in these two stories that we are introduced to the ridiculously named fan favourite Nimrod. I have no clue why the fandom holds this moustache twirling villain in such high regard. All three of these are murky, grimdark little tales, with questioning companions and the Doctor just letting people down. Detailing the Doctor's many run-ins with the evil organisation known as The Forge. I just do not like The Forge. I lose track of how many secret organisations there are in this universe, honestly. But most of all, I feel like they made the same story three times. It's just this one has a multi-Doctor gimmick, and this one has a companion being obviously manipulated, leading to my favourite trope, Liar Revealed. 
The doctor never told you the truth about your mother, did he? He told me enough. He told me you killed her. I've heard this story before. We all know the Seventh Doctor lies. This story makes Hex look like a really naive gullible idiot. 8.1? Really? Number 3. The Vault I will admit, in 2017, this one had me going. It's such an obvious mystery box. And I think that's why it was so effective for me. Who is in the vault? I was awaiting some hard Stephen Moffat hijinks. Maybe it's the Doctor. Maybe it's a future incarnation of the Doctor. An unspeakable evil we have not met yet. Hell, even John Sim was in the trailer. And the actual reveal was even a step down from that, just being the most predictable option possible. Who else could it have been? And it's like Moffat knew this himself, because after five episodes of teasing us with little details, Moffat just shows it to us in the most unceremonious way possible. Five minutes into Extremis and it's, uh... Oh, I guess it's just Missy then. I take it back. Yo, Moffat, can we have more of the silence, please? Complicated nonsense is better than just in-your-face rejection. This one was pure disappointment. And then it makes us watch in Lie of the Land as he slowly enters the vault, like we didn't just learn who it was in there two episodes ago. Boo! Missy's redemption, on the other hand, is the series arc, but why hype her entrance? You've trolled me, sir. You've trolled me for the last time. I wish it had been something brand new. Series 10 dropped the ball for me right then. Number 4, The Divergent Saga Much like eSpace, the Doctor and Charlie are in a new plane of existence. These worlds have no rules. With their new companion, Kariz, and dealing with the fallout of Zagreus and Rassilon, the new TARDIS team must find their TARDIS whilst evading the mysterious Kroger. There are some brilliant stories in here, and the amount of planning and dedication that went into this arc on Big Finish's part is impressive. There are, of course, also some abysmal ones. It's just that following the big mindfuck that was Neverland, Zagreus, you'd want things to take it a bit easier. But the Divergent arc is so eager to throw the traditional rulebook out and double down on the abstract craziness. And I respect it for that, but it still doesn't quite work. I love Keodroya. It is a bonkers story with mythology references that feels like I'm on an acid trip. There's a Minotaur and three Doctors, and I don't remember why. This story is a mental tsunami. But unlike Keodroya, many of these other stories just go over their own head. The Divergent is a great concept, but stories either feel too similar or not that exceptionally strange at all. One of the locations in these stories is just a cave. D just a cave. Whilst on the other end of the spectrum, some of the locations are gorgeous, surreal, Dardarist landscapes, but the storytelling is super unambitious and rudimentary. So when they're repetitive and dry, how experimental are these stories, really? And it's very strange to me to learn that there were meant to be four seasons of the Divergent Saga. Yeah, they cut it short, less than halfway, because Doctor Who was returning to the TV, and they did not want to alienate viewers with three hours of The Next Life. I still have not listened to The Next Life, because I do not have three hours to devote to actor Don Warrington. Hopefully it's good. In the end, these are stories that are either not weird enough or too weird for their own good. Honestly, I'm glad it got cut short. It doesn't entirely work, but again, that's what experiments are for. And last of all, the hybrid. The hybrid could have been so good, man. It really could have. It's ominous, vague, thematically relevant for the series. But it's a brilliant misdirect. Because it sounds like something that could be a season finale threat. And the Doctor's clued in. Everyone in Gallifrey seems to know what the hybrid is, but the audience is kept way in the dark. It creeps through the series, and then reveals itself to ultimately be nothing. Nothing but the Doctor's own series of mistakes he's made in this episode. The hybrid is never overly explained to us as a viewer. Until it is. 
and it also joins together the motif of series 9. These are a string of episodes with many hybrids. A shielder, the Zygons, Davros, maybe even the Doctor himself. I urge you to reconsider what a good idea this is. If the hybrid was just the Doctor? I'm sorry, that makes all of Hellbent click into thematic place. He's finally reunited with his home planet, and he immediately ditches them for the human. Here is a character with such rich development that he has finally found Gallifrey and has decided they're not his people anymore. Moffat even has the goal to hint at it. Why couldn't the hybrid be half Time Lord, half human? And then he swerves and it's just the Doctor Donna all over again. Shame. Honestly, it seemed like he was going in a direction of a really, really controversial, fun idea. I am one of the weirdo fans that sees no problem with him being half human, half Time Lord. I never have. Let me know why that's sacrilege in the comments below, I guess. But trust me, that would have made a lot more sense in this story than what we got. It did all the heavy lifting, and then there was no reveal. Because again, there was no mystery to crack. No villain to hype, and no mystery box to open. Moffat. Hellbent truly took all of the season arcs down with it. I am now about to disappear before I am court-martialed by the Doctor Who fandom. Goodbye!